Welcome friends to this uh, new lecture of uh, soil science and technology and in this lecture we will be trying to finish this uh, soil organic matter and then we will be discussing about the soil organisms. So, obviously in the last lecture we if you remember that we talked about different types of organic matter decomposition, how organic matter decomposed based on the organic matter quality, then we talked about different pools of soil, different pools of carbon and then uh, you know how organic matter forms. So, let us start from here and in this here in this uh, in this slide you can see the soil organic matter distribution obviously if you see the top uh, you know at the top layer of the soil the concentration or the, the amount of organic matter is always higher as compared to the subsoil. So, as you go down from top layer to subsoil layer obviously the the organic matter percentage of organic matter always goes down. And if you see the um, you know organic matter obviously these hydroxyl groups and uh, you know acidic groups are there and uh, these uh, groups basically undergoes uh, dissociation and basically they attract these positive cations. So, we will discuss in details uh, later on. So, this just an uh, you know this just gives an idea about the how, how these organic matter attracts different types of cations onto their surface. So, uh, distribution of organic matter depends from varies from one soil to another soil. So, let us talk about the humus. Now, humus is a complex and resistant mixture of brown and dark brown amorphous and colloidal organic substances that result from microbial decomposition and synthesis and has chemical and physical properties of great significance of soil. So, it is, we have already discussed that humus is a more resistant product, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is developed from different types of microbial decomposition and uh, you can see here this is a three dimensional view of a humus molecule, humus molecule which is very very complex and one other thing you know another simplified diagram showing the principal chemical group which is responsible for high amount of negative charge on humus colloids. If you remember humus in case of humus the CEC is quite a couple of folds higher than that of uh, the CEC of clay. So, obviously you can the three groups you can see here are basically carboxylic group uh, sorry. Uh, there basically carboxylic group and then phenolic hydroxyl group and alcoholic hydroxyl group. So, and also their dissociated forms are given here. So, uh, you know these uh, this dissociated you can see they are negatively charged and as a result they can attract these positively charged cations and also uh, some positively dissociated uh, charge in which can attract the negative uh, uh, you know the anions also. So, that is the large you know uh, you can see that is why it can absorb a large amount of plant nutrients for maintaining the soil fertility. So, uh, what is basically uh, you know this humus is composed of. So, the humic groups uh, if, if you see humic substances have aromatic type of aromatic type of structures and the humic substances are classified if you if you break down a humus we will get basically three types of humic substances. One is called humic acid, another is called fulvic acid, another is humin and these substances are classified based on their resistance to degradation and solubility in acids and alkali. So, we will see that later on. Again humic acid, fulvic acid and humin. So, what is humic acid? The fraction of the humic substances that is not soluble in water under acidic condition that is pH less than 2, but is soluble in a higher pH values and they can be extracted by soil by various reagents uh, which is insoluble in dilute acids. So, again remember that Humic acid is insoluble in acidic condition less than pH 2, however, it is soluble in alkaline condition. The second important component is uh, fulvic acid and the fraction of humic substances that is soluble in water under all pH condition and they remain in solution after removal of the humic acid by acidification. So, the fulvic acid is basically soluble under all pH condition whereas humic acid is only soluble in the in the higher pH values. 
and third one is humin the fraction of humic substances that is not soluble in water at any ph values and in any alkaline or in alkali so humins are black in color so remember that the low molecular weight fulvic acid the fulvic acid has low molecular weight they have high oxygen but lower carbon content than high molecular weight humic acid and fulvic acid contain more functional groups of an acidic nature particularly acidic group and the total acidity of the fulvic acid is 900 to 1400 milli equivalent per 100 grams and are considerably higher than that of humic acid which has only 400 to 870 uh, milli equivalent per 100 gram. So, another important difference is that while oxygen in fulvic acid can be accounted largely in known functional group that is acidic group, phenolic group and carb carbox uh, carbonyl group a high portion of the oxygen in humic acid seems to occur in a structural component of the nucleus. So, these are some important features of these fractions so, obviously again humic acid is uh, insoluble in uh, acidic condition soluble in alkaline condition fulvic acid in soluble uh, fulvic acid is soluble in all the condition insoluble fraction is called humin it is black in nature fulvic acid contains more oxygen containing group more acidic in nature and humic acid contain more carbon content and it is more molecular weight it is having more molecular weight so uh, this slide shows that uh, what are the different features of these uh, humic fractions? So, if you can see the fulvic acid are light yellow to yellow brown in color, humic acids are dark brown to gray black in color and humic is black in color. So, obviously, if we go from fulvic acid to humic acid, increase in the intensity of the color you can see here. So, when we are going from fulvic acid to humic acid, humin, obviously, there you can see the intensity of the color increases. Also, increase in the degree of polymerization, obviously, fulvic acid is simpler, however, humin is much more complex. And then, increase in molecular weight, obviously, it is quite uh, understandable because uh, fulvic acid is uh, low molecular weight and increase in carbon content, decrease in oxygen content. For remember, fulvic acid contains more oxygen containing functional groups and then decrease in exchange acidity and uh, obviously decrease in degree of solubility because fulvic acid is soluble in all condition, humic acid is soluble in only as, uh, alkaline condition, humic, humine is insoluble. So, this shows a very good comparison of these three fractions and obviously these are humic acids of pt sand uh, soil and uh, you know these are uh, electron microscope uh, view of these humic acids. So, let us see how we can separate these humic fractions. So, uh, the soil or from the soil organic matter we can separate this humic fraction based on their solubility. So, if we start with the soil organic matter let us first uh, you know treat with the alkali. So, it will separate the humic substances which will be soluble and humin and non-humic matter which are basically insoluble. So, in the first step basically humin and non-humic matter are separated from humic substances and humic substances contains both humic acid and fulvic acid. So, in the second step when humic substances is react is mixed with the acid obviously the fulvic acid will be soluble however humic acid will be insoluble because we know that humic acid cannot be soluble in acidic condition. So, this fulvic acid which will be soluble then we, if we can adjust the pH to 4.8 obviously that will be separated into fulvic acid which is soluble and beta humus which is insoluble. And humic acid which was insoluble with acid reaction if we reflex that with the alcohol it will convert into two major fraction one is hematomelanic acid which is soluble and another is insoluble humic acid. Now, this insoluble humic acid when we treat with neutral salt it will again further divided into soluble brown humic fraction and insoluble grey humic fraction. So, you can see how based on their solubility these fractions are separated from soil organic matter. So, there are three different form you know there are different humus formation theories obviously uh, the lignin theory which was given by scientist Waxman in 1936 then Kononova's theory 
and then polyphenol theory which is the recent one given by Flegg and Scotting in 1964. So these theories basically show basically tells us about how this humus form formation takes place. So uh, according to lignin theory humic substances are formed due to incomplete degradation of lignin and Kononova's theory says that uh, humic substances are formed by cellulose decomposing mycobacteria earlier to lignin decomposition. Whereas polyphenol theory says that as per this theory the humic substances are formed from the condensation of the phenolic compounds and the polyphenols of lignins are oxidized to quinones and these quinones are condensed to with low molecular weight microbial products to form humic molecules and the microbial product are amino acids, nucleic acids and phospholipids. So these basically three theories shows the pathway through which this humus basically forms. Okay. So what is the influence of organic matter into the soil? Why we are studying this organic matter? Because uh, you know dark in you know organic matter is dark in color. So dark in color will facilitate soil warming and also it will improve the physical condition of the soil because devoid of organic matters the soil will be physically less uh, I mean less uh, I would say that when the soil contains more amount of organic matter the soil aggregation formation is much more and as a result soil physical condition is improved and also soil you know uh, this organic matter is a reservoir of plant nutrients because of high amount of charge which develops over the surface. The clay humus complex have better buffering and exchange capacity and also organic matter can form stable complexes with some metals and influences their availability to the plants by forming some chelated compounds and biodegradation of different chemicals like pesticides to the interaction with organic matter is an important phenomenon in relation to the human animal health. We have already discussed it in our previous lectures. So the humic ma organic matter is huge huge important as far as the soil physical chemical and biological properties are concerned. So how we measure the soil organic matter obviously we talked about this Wackley and Black method in our soil testing lectures and but remember that this Wackley and Black method we can measure up to 6 percent of soil organic matter when it is more than 6 percent of soil organic matter generally we prefer two methods one is called LOI or loss on ignition method uh, we call it loss on ignition method given by two scientists called Nelson and Somers in 1996 which basically uh, uh, you know tells the what is the what is the you know it basically gravimetrically measures the loss of carbon when we put a known uh, weight of soil within an oven and we uh, you know we we evap you know we oxidize all the carbon at high temperature so when the all the carbon which is present in the soil get oxidized to carbon dioxide obviously there will be difference in the weight and this weight difference we will be measuring and gravimetrically it will calculate the soil organic matter. And finally CN analyzer this is an advanced method carbon nitrogen analyzer and uh, generally in advanced uh, uh, you know soil testing lab we use that and it is very very precise. So the um, so the working principle of CN chain analyzer in a, there is a sample holder and there is an ignition chamber we incorporate oxygen through it. So the sample is injected here though say there is a pre plaque column and ultimately the sample uh, the carbon which is present within the sample get to oxidized to carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide move through this GC or gas chromatography column and ultimately it is uh, detected through T TCD detector a thermal conductivity detector and it will give the spectrum of uh, the compounds and from that we can calculate the concentration of carbon hydrogen and nitrogen okay so this is the principle of the carbon uh, chn or ch both are same chn and cn analyzer so how to manage the soil organic matter now there are several ways to manage the soil organic matter first of all the conservation tillage is one of the important aspect then providing the cover crops then crop rotation 
crop residues applying and then nutrient management, organic amendment, commercial humates, all these are different management strategies for maintaining the soil organic matter. Obviously, conservation tillage helps in maintaining the soil organic carbon because uh, uh, you know they less disturb the soil. Then cover crops, crop rotation, crop residues, all these add organic matter into the soil and then organic amendments like different types of organic manure when you apply different types of bulky organic manure, concentrated organic manure when you apply that also adds to the soil organic matter. Now, what is the implication of soil organic matter in the climate change? Now, if you see here, there is a proportion of the gases responsible for the global warming or uh, greenhouse gas effect. So, obviously, carbon dioxide uh, is responsible for a large portion of it apart from nitrous oxide, methane and fluorine gases. So, soil is basically cultivated land in the major source of these gases because when you cultivate the soil, it exposes the soil and whatever carbon is present that will expose and that will be oxidized by you know by by the by the by the oxygen which is present in the air and ultimately this carbon will you know will be released into the atmosphere uh, in the form of carbon dioxide. So, it is clear that among the many strategies sequestering more carbon into the soil under croplands and grazing lands are restoring formerly drained wetlands are the three most important. So, again sequestering carbon. So, this is very important carbon sequestration. What is carbon sequester? Carbon sequestration means we will prevent the movement of carbon from soil to atmosphere. So, how could you do that? So, another one way is to conservation tillage. So, in the conservation tillage, we are not exposing the soil. So, as a result, the carbon oxidation and formation of carbon dioxide is reduced. So, it is a one of the strategy of carbon, you know, of this uh, 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 carbon sequestration. And then fortunately, these measures are quite feasible as their implementation would not only reduce greenhouse gases, but also they improve the soil quality and provide the benefits of enhanced soil function and productivity to the owners. So, these are some strategies and remember that that is why soil carbon sequestration is very very important nowadays. Okay. So, we have finished this soil organic carbon lecture. Let us go ahead and start soil organism. Guys, in this lecture we will be covering these following concepts. Uh, what are the different types of soil organisms? and their role, uh, the roles of the soil organisms, then classification of soil organisms and different types of soil organisms. So, soil organisms, uh, the, you know, the basically if you consider the soil, the, the soil e, uh, is having abundant and millions and millions of living organisms which make it a living and dynamic system. And these organisms not only help in development of the soil, but also carry out a number of transformation facilitating the availability of the nutrient to the plant. As you have, uh, I, we have already discussed in case of nitrification process, for say for an example, in case of nitrification process, it is mediated through different types of microorganisms. The ammonification is mediated by microorganisms. The decomposition of organic matter is mediated by microorganisms because you know it requires extracellular enzymes for oxidations and uh, you know for oxidation into carbon dioxide. So, if you remember those things. So, all these are very very important. Now, this role of microorganism in soil fertility is first of all it helps in decomposing the organic matter. And also plant nutrient transformation through, main, for, through maintaining different cycles like nitrogen, sulfur, all these cycles. And then soil organisms are also useful for the preparation of different biofertilizers and composts. We will discuss compost to and these biofertilizers and compost will help in building the soil fertility or increase the soil fertility for better crop growth. So, these are very, very important. These micro, without these microorganisms, the soil would be literally a dead system. So, what are the class, what is the classification of soil organism? So, organism in soil can be broadly classified into soil flora and soil fauna. Now, soil flora and uh, soil fauna, uh, we should, there should be a discontinuity here. So, basically organisms are you know soil flora, the soil flora is again divided into 
microflora and macroflora and within the microflora and macroflora the in case of macroflora there is a plant roots and macroalgae are there and in case of microflora bacteria actinomycetes fungi and algae are important and in case of soil fauna uh, there are some macrofauna and microfauna and in case of macrofauna obviously earthworm termites ants grubs lugs snails centipedes millipedes are important and in case of microfauna obviously protozoa nematodes and rotifers are important so you can see a basic overview of the soil organism classification okay so what is the size relative size differences of these organisms so you can see if we consider sand silt and uh, clay obviously the sand is the coarser portions so vertebrates here so earthworms are in the sand anthropods obviously nematodes then protozoa you know comes in between then plant roots then fungi algae bacteria archaea and viruses so remember that viruses are the most minute fraction and uh, in the soil microflora obviously bacteria are the smallest organisms okay so algae and algae comes in between bacteria and fungi and in between algae and bacteria there is uh, also actinomycetes so let us start with the microorganisms in the soil so the macroorganisms in the soil include different like different uh, organisms like acari like columbola like uh, you know like uh, isopoda then amphipoda and earthworm and so on and so forth so a population estimation is highly difficult as they are not uniformly distributed so the population is lesser than the microorganism remember that in case of macroorganism their population is lesser than the microorganism and why they are very very useful they are very very useful because they help in mixing churning and fragmentation of the plant materials which accelerates the decomposition process because for decomposition we need to break down the soil organic matter first secondly the forms of burrows and tunnels which increases soil aeration and drainage so that is also important because without the you know presence of oxygen these oxygen you know organic matter decomposition does not take place and they also ingest the soil into the guts guts of the earthworms and uh, you know uh, and they convert into the worm crust we call them mal humus or other name is vermicompost we will discuss that and they also feed on microorganisms including pan pathogens so these are some of the uh, uh, you know utility of these microorganisms so let us start with the earthworms now earthworms can be of two type one of these one is called epigeic type of earthworm another is endogeic earthworms the epigeic earthworms are surface feeders so they remain in the surface and feed on the surface litters endogeic are feed on the uh, different materials within the soil the geophagous species of earthworms you can see this is an uh, epigeic earthworm and these are the burrows made within the soil by endogeic earthworms so the geophagous species of earthworms uh, you know ingest materials per day which is 5 to 36 times of their body weight and they the worm crust they create is rich in nitrogen phosphorus calcium and the casting rate is 2600 tons per hectare per year so it is a huge amount of uh, you know uh, cast worm crust they produce per year which further helps in uh, building the soil nitro soil fertility status so earthworm worked soils are generally have high porosity high water holding capacity then water infiltration rate water stable aggregates and different nutrients you can see the burrows which are made uh, and uh, these are helpful for water movement and also they helps in uh, aggregation of the soil and the earthworm earthworm increases surface area and the availability of organic matter for microbial action by mixing it thoroughly with the soil so these are some activities of the earthworms beneficial activities of the earthworms another important is vermicompost we will discuss vermicompost in details in the next lecture so earthworms are being used for hastening the decomposition of the farm produce and waste for composting and the product is called the vermicompost and the species which are generally used for vermicompost are isenia foetida 
Eutilus Eugeni and Perunis excavatus and Icenia foetida is reported to be the more efficient than others. So, you can see these are vermicompost which is made through the earthworms. We will be discussing this vermicompost later on. Termites, termites also disturb the soil while preparing their nest. So, they are also important for water and air, air movement within the soil. Plant roots, uh, they are macroflora, plant roots exert a physical pressure on the soil particles, uh, you know, influencing their aggregation and also the environmental, you know, uh, remember that well, a rhizosphere, this is a very important term. So, this rhizosphere is the environment under the influence of the roots. So, this is very important uh, habitat for microorganisms and also the root produce different types of uh, chemicals like exudate, secretions, mucicels, lysates which are also helpful for different types of nutrient transformation and different uh, mid and, and accelerating different biochemical process. So, because of these chemicals a different types of niche is formed in the rhizosphere. Remember rhizosphere is very very chemically active and biologically active zone where different types of nutrient transformations are going on. So, let us start with the bacteria. Now, bacteria is the smallest and most numerous of the organism present in the soil and they are having different types of shapes like spherical are uh, known as cocci, uh, you know, uh, you know, spherical cocci, rod shaped are, uh, you know, bacillus and spiral shapes are known as spirilla and common bacterial genera found in soil are uh, you know pseudomonas, then arthrobacter, clostridium, uh, bacillus, acrobacter, micrococcus, agrobacterium. Remember that I have highlighted this bacillus because this is the most abundant uh, soil bacteria. You can see here bacillus here as and followed by pseudomonas and pseudomonas is the second most abundant bacteria in the soil and this clostridium is strictly anaerobic. Now, Apart from this uh, soil bacteria also, the soil also contains some other bacteria like Delovibrio, Mixococcus and Polyendium and these genera help to maintain the biological population by keeping a check on the growth of the other bacteria. So, this is very very important for maintaining the biological equilibrium within the soil. So, <coughs> What are the roles of bacteria in the soil? Obviously, you know that nitrogen fixation is an important role. We have already, you know, we have already discussed about the rhizobium and how they fix atmospheric nitrogen, then phosphate solubilization, organic matter decomposition, synthesis of humus, nitrification, denitrification in waterlogged soil, protein decomposition, ammonification, transformation of various micro and micronutrients in the soil. So, all these are very, you know, mediated through bacteria in the soil. So, these are, the, these are very, very important, uh, you know, activities of the bacteria. The second important is actinomycetes. Now, taxonomically actinomycetes are in the evolutionary phase between bacteria and fungi because they are called fungi like bacteria because they are like bacteria which possess aerial hyphae like fungi. So, you can see here strands of actinomycetes. Now, they are generally found in dry soils and common genera found in soils are streptomyces, micromonospora, nocardia, thermoactinomycetes. Remember that the population of actinomycetes is, is, is high in compost regions. In fact, they are the highest, uh, you know, microorganism, highest population microorganism which are present in compost pit and they are nutritionally heterotrophic and tolerant to high temperature. And they play the most important role in humus formation and pigmentation of the humus. And they cannot compete with bacteria and fungi. So, they grow on such substances which are not decomposable by bacteria and fungi. So, these are some important points of actinomycetes. Remember that streptomycetes, streptomyces is the most important uh, soil actinomycetes and they are the most abundant soil uh, actinomycetes. So, okay guys, so let us wrap up here in this uh, uh, soil microorganisms and uh, in the next lecture we will start, we will we'll try to finish this soil microorganism as well as uh, we will talk about the composting methods also. Thank you.